What up, IDS Mob? Welcome to the Introvert Dating Success Show. I'm Harry Wilmington, and today we are interviewing Elizabeth Sherman. So, Elizabeth Sherman is a certified life and weight loss coach who specializes in helping people in their later years identify and overcome obstacles that get in their way and turn around negative thought patterns in your life so that you can get consistent in your healthy habits. Uh, she also has a podcast that she hosts called the Done With Dieting Podcast, where she discusses health-related topics like food, moving, stress and sleep management, our bodies, and how we think about those things. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. This is so fun. Can't wait to I'm get started. You, me too. I'm glad you could come on. Like I said, I, I uh, checked out your website and I saw you know, the journey that you went through involving your weight and evolving just how you feel about yourself. And I know a lot of guys go through that and they don't always talk about it, but they also have their own set of weight issues that can correlate with how they think about themselves and how they think about their relationships. So we'll get into all that. But first, I always like to ask my guests, uh, what was your dating journey like and what was it like prior to meeting your now husband? Yeah. Um, so first of all, my now husband is my second husband. I was, uh, I am divorced and it's so funny because I was just talking to um, another coach about this, that I, when I met my first husband, I wrote down a list of things that I didn't want in a partner and he met all those. What I didn't do was write down a list of things that I did want in a partner um, so that, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted. And when I think about my dating journey, what's really interesting is I think that my self-esteem was so low back then that I would just take anyone who would have me. And I think that, you know, where I am today and where I was way back then has been a huge journey in personal development and understanding who I am, getting to like myself, and in turn, then really kind of presenting that to the world and not feeling like I needed to hide it. And so when I think about the, yeah, even the dating journey that I had with my husband, um, it was still a lot of self-loathing and like, why would anyone really like me? Like, I didn't even really like myself. And so I, when I think about who I was when I met him, I feel extremely fortunate that I was able to attract and keep him because he's an amazing person. That's so interesting. So where did you think, where do you think those thoughts originated from early on in terms of not being confident about yourself and not thinking about what you like, like where, where do that, those things come from? You know, I, I do call myself a feminist and I've been looking into how women are socialized and from kids on up to adulthood. And I think that it's very much a female thing that women are socialized to doubt themselves, to also take what is available to us and not to ask for much. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So, um, in terms of, so you had your first husband, what is it that went wrong with that relationship? Oh, good question. Yeah. So when we got married, I don't, well, first of all, I don't have children. And when we got married, um, myself and my first husband, I didn't know if I wanted children and I didn't know that I didn't want children but I didn't know that I did. I, it was still a big question mark. And in thinking that through, that's kind of a deal breaker, right? Oh. If your partner wants to have children and you don't, that's really a red flag. It's not like I want to live in the city and I want to live in the suburbs, right? Um, and so he was banking on the fact that I would change my mind. And it wasn't until I kind of, I like within we we were only married for like three months or three years. And uh, I started getting pressure about when are we going to start having kids. And so I think that that was really what was the the deal breaker for us. Yeah. Hmm. No, that, that makes sense. Cause I, I've had that same journey. Like I never want kids, don't want kids, don't have them now. And so there have been women in my past who thought, well, I'll just change his mind later and yeah. were 
very disappointed later on when that did not happen because it's like I already said this thing because I wanted to prevent that exact scenario from happening. You know? Yeah. So, so what attracted you then to your now husband? Like, what were things during your process of dating him that just made that made him stand out or made you really think like this could be the guy for me? Yeah. So here's what's really interesting is I was thinking about it on my walk today, and what made me feel fall in love with him was that he took care of me. And what I mean by that is, so again, I called myself a feminist. I'm going to out myself. And so I'm actually okay doing things on my own, but I think that it was also really nice to have someone put his arm around me when we were crossing the street or put himself in the position of protecting me when we would walk across the street or something like that. My husband is also super generous. And so, um, you know, I was very willing to pay for half of our dates and all of that stuff. Um, but just his generosity is something that even today is one of his strengths. Um, yeah. And what else? We just, He's my person. I don't know. Yeah. That's interesting. Like, so uh, even with uh, you being a feminist, there were still things he was doing, like that was in terms of taking the lead role or like protecting you that you still felt you really needed. Exactly. Well, that just made me feel comfortable and safe. Hmm. Yeah. And so like, I think that a lot of men today, and I'm just guessing, don't really know where they stand with feminists. Like, am I supposed to do something or am I not? Like, am I supposed to hold the door open? Yes. I mean, it's it's still, whatever you're going to do for someone else is like just being basic, having basic kindness is what you would do for your date, I think. Okay. That's, that's definitely not a bad thing for sure. Right. So, okay. So, now, according to your bio, uh, in terms of the weight loss stuff, you had your own weight loss journey, and yeah. it seems to have started around the time of your mom's death. Can you give us a snapshot of like what your life was like at the time, like health wise, uh, mentally wise, and what things like that contributed to you being out of shape at that time? Yeah. So um, growing up, we never really, I never saw my body as, I don't know, um, I was always kind of out of shape. I didn't really think about exercise. Food was just there and what I ate. And it was the way that I was raised that our bodies get us from point A to point B. Um, and it wasn't until I saw my mom go through her breast cancer journey that I realized that how we treat our bodies is actually a huge indicator of how well our bodies take care of us. And so um, what happened is, so I moved from Chicago to Austin, Texas to be with my husband. And pro tip, kids, do not do this. We had been dating long distance for, gosh, seven months. And I moved from Chicago to Austin, Texas to be with him. Uh, I didn't really feel a lot of ties to uh, Chicago and always thought that I would move someday. And we bought a house together, wow. <laughs> not living in the same city, um, and moved in together. And we're very fortunate that we're married today. And actually, we live in Mexico now. But yeah, so don't do that. I, I was thinking <laughs> about like... If my friend came to me and said, yeah, I'm going to move across the country to be with this person, should I do it? I would be like, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Anyway. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was at that time when I moved from Chicago to Austin to be with Gary that my mom passed away from breast cancer. So he had, we had already met and established a relationship when I was heavier. Um, and it was, I think part of it was, of course, what they call the health belief model, which is when we see something foreboding. And I saw that the way that my mom was, had treated her body and thought about it and thought about food and exercise and all of that stuff, that I could see my future in where she was. And I did really? not want that. Yeah. 
Do you, yeah. does, does uh I don't I don't know in terms of like does bad diet contribute or or have a greater risk in causing someone to have breast cancer? Well, so excess. Well, that's what happened. So I went and I started googling and found out that being overweight is a huge risk factor for many diseases. Cancer is one of them. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So heart disease, diabetes, and others as well. So yeah. And you know, we don't know really what the relationship is between food and cancer. We know that there's a correlative relationship, but we don't know that there's a causation relationship between the two for sure. Right. So you can't like point out, say this, because of this specific thing, this is exactly what happens. It's just kind of like, there's a trend that shows that more often this happens with the, with this kind of body thing going on. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So how, how old were you when your mom passed away? I was 33 years old. Okay. So at that point, she passes away. Mm-hmm. And at this point, in terms of your, your weight journey, you're still at a heavier set weight. So yeah. at that point, I so I assume at that point you started trying to lose weight. What did you find in that journey? Was it difficult or what, what challenges came along in that journey in, try, in, try, in terms of trying to, trying to lose weight at that age? Yeah. So I would love to say that once I figured out that being overweight was a huge risk factor to getting cancer as well as these other diseases that I immediately changed everything. But unfortunately, it probably took me another 15 years, um, 15 years, no, let's say 10 years to really get my shiz together. And what I mean by that is I was doing the whole diet thing, over exercising, under eating the, what we call the, um, restrict binge regret cycle, which is we restrict during the week. And then on the weekend we go overboard and then we're like, Oh, I feel terrible, not only physically, but mentally and emotionally. And I'm not going to do that anymore. And so then we restrict again during the week. And it's just this cycle that keeps perpetuating. I feel like I went through every single diet. I went through every single fitness fad. I took supplements. I, I did it all constantly looking for that magic pill that would suddenly make me thin and beautiful because I actually had a glimpse into it. See, the thing is, is that before my mom passed away, I would look at women in magazines and I would see like, yeah, that's not me. That's not attainable. And it wasn't until I started walking my dog on a regular basis that I saw that I was becoming a little bit leaner. And then it was kind of like everything kind of kicked into gear. I was like, oh, this is possible. And, but I was still really struggling with it. Uh, I did a bodybuilding competition and even in the bodybuilding competition, I think that that actually gave me an eating disorder because I was so restrictive for the weeks ahead of time. Like I couldn't eat anything. I think it was the two weeks before the actual show. Yeah. I've seen some um, uh, women bodybuilders on, on my Facebook page and say the same thing. They got to like really like cut back on how much they can eat, but it's like, they're not eating, but they also have to work out a lot. So it's like, which makes you hungrier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's not necessarily a healthy thing. Um, but I, you know, here's the thing is that I still had this negative aspect of my body. I remember my husband and I driving to um, my second competition. I did two back to back and I was in the car and I was looking down at my stomach and I have pictures. I had a six pack, but I was looking down at my uh, stomach while I was sitting in the car and I could see like rolls. And I was like, I'm fat still. Like, how is this even possible? And so why that's important is we think that dieting and being in a smaller body is going to give us happiness. We think that dieting and being in a smaller body is going to give us self-esteem. Our brain tells us that when I weigh this weight, then I'm going to be acceptable. Then I'm going to be sexy. Then other people are going to want to talk to me. Hmm. But if we don't actually do the work to improve our self-esteem along the way, then what happens is we get to that goal 
and we still have those negative thoughts, right? Mm, yeah. And I'm assuming if those thoughts are still there, that actually probably makes it easier to like go back to your comfort, which is the food. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's interesting because this is, I mean, so at your website, you know, it says that you work mostly with women, but we talked before the show, obviously very typically tend to be the ones really going for a lot of this stuff, but you also work with men. Um, it's just interesting that that's not really talked about a lot in men's circles. Like even like I have friends that are on the bigger end, but it's not like a, a regular conversation or it's not, they, they'll go to somebody to try to get that work done. Cause honestly for us, it's a lot of times it's the ego thing. Like I'm going to handle this thing and get it done situated. And then we don't talk to anybody. Um, which kind of yeah. I think that what happens with men is that men go to the other extreme. So men feel like they need to be bodybuilder and buff and go to that extreme versus just wanting to lose weight. Like there's, there's a huge thing about muscle building, right? Yeah, um, yeah. and not all men want to look like that. No, that's very true. In fact, um, so I went through my own journey. Like I'm five, nine and a half. So at my, my biggest weight should be no more than like 167. And a couple of years ago, I got up to like 193 just because I was eating baked goods at home every day and just not walking and just whatever. And so I wanted to lose weight. But the first part, my brain was like, but should I be working out? Because I could be trying to lose weight and also gaining muscle. And I didn't really want to. Like, I like being a linear guy. So I was able to focus on that and make it happen. But I'm sure there's that there's that there's a clash of like, well, don't want to be skinny, don't want to lose, and don't, or don't want to like actually build up muscle, and that's a, that's a lot of work to try to do both at the same time. Yeah. So typically, the only person who can lose body fat and gain muscle at the same time is the beginner exerciser. So the person mm -hmm. who's just starting out their journey. Um, after that, what you need to do is you need to uh, go through different periods where you're um, and I don't necessarily recommend this. This is a whole dieting thing. And, you know, my podcast is called done with dieting. So, but yeah. I'm just telling you the technical aspect to it, that you can have periods of having fewer calories where you're focusing on fat loss and then have other periods where like, and we're talking months at a time where you're focusing on uh, muscle gain. And of course, when you gain muscle, you're also going to gain some fat. And when you lose body fat, you're also going to lose some muscle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now that's just an FYI. Now here's the other thing that I really want to point out because you just said something that threw up a red flag for me. And that is that specifically for women, but also for men, that as we age, we really don't want to use exercise as a form of calorie balance. Calorie balance being calories in versus calories out. If I have more calories in than I have calories out, then I'm going to gain weight. And the other side of the seesaw is that if I have fewer calories in than I have calories out, then I'm going to lose weight. And then the balance is calories in versus calories out are equal, I maintain. And so we really don't want to use exercise as a form of calorie balance. And the reason why is because then we use exercise as a form of punishment. So I overate cake, I drank too much beer, I ate a bunch of pasta, now I have to work it off. And what that does is it creates a really poor relationship between my body and exercise. And what we want to do instead, especially as we get older, is we want to break apart that relationship that we all have between <laughs> exercise and calories out. And I remember the very first time I heard it, my brain exploded. I was like, how, how am I supposed to possibly think about this? Right. And so now... What we want to do is we want to think about exercise as a form of self-care. And I think it's really important to talk about self-care just briefly here for a second, yeah, yeah. because when we think about self-care, we think that it's a largely feminine thing. We think that self-care is massages and manicures and facials and all that spa stuff. And I think that that spa stuff is amazing. You should totally do it. But... It's not the only thing. 
I see self-care as taking care of the future version of yourself. And so what that means is not procrastinating and doing things, um, well, eating to take care of the future version of yourself, eating so that you feel good tomorrow, not in the moment because we all love eating Oreos or brownies or chips or whatever it is that you like. We all love the, the way things taste in the moment, but when we eat too much, then it doesn't make us feel good. So really thinking about who do I want to be tomorrow and how can I really protect her or him? And then the other piece to that is really looking at exercise as a form of stress management. So I exercise so that I relieve stress instead of causing stress because overexercising can be a stress. Sitting on the couch can also be a stress. And so really learning to love whatever it is that you're doing, joining activities that you really enjoy doing, whether it's running, whether it's you know doing some sort of group training, whether it's cycling or volleyball or whatever, just be active and really think about, you know, how do I relieve stress in a physical way? Because what tends to happen is when we don't exercise, it, all of our health habits are really tied together. And so when at the end of the day, if I haven't exercised my body, you're going to feel wired, but tired. And so then you're going to like maybe drink alcohol and then you're going to try to go to bed and you're going to be all restless and you're not going to sleep well. And then what happens is it just perpetuates the next day and you make poor eating choices and so on and so forth. So all of your health habits really support one another and the better you can do with, um, and it, it, they also will go up together. So when I eat foods that are right for my body, then I have more energy to exercise and then I mm -hmm. sleep better and it all, I also, um, sorry, I also uh, manage my stress better as well. So right, right. it all comes together. Yeah. That's so interesting, but like, because I know uh, it's, it can be very, very hard, obviously to, you know, you're go from a guy that's like a little bit bigger and kind of sedentary and, and not doing stuff. It's like, okay, I'm going to try to eat better. I'm going to try to move around a little bit. And I, I just, I noticed for me, there were definitely blockers at times where, like you said, like you kind of go eating good for a little bit and then you want to reward yourself on the weekend by like, I'm going to go or, or holidays are the worst. Like try, I started my, my weight loss journey, like right after Thanksgiving. So going into Christmas, going into like Valentine's day, new year's where it's like all this food stuff. And I was able to do it, but it was really hard at times to motivate myself to do that. And so like, how do you, how does, how does a guy like, a, how is he able to make that change where he's actually motivated to want to actually do these things and not go back on it. Yeah, that's a really good question. So a couple things. One is, I love that you use the term motivated because when we start a program or a plan or whatever it is, we think that we're going to be motivated the entire time, right? But motivation is actually a feeling and feelings are very fickle. So within a day, I could feel sadness and energized and happiness and anger and motivation and bored. Okay. And so we think that we're going to feel motivated all the time. And so if we think that if we expect that we have to exercise or do the things only when we're motivated, then what's going to happen is when we're not motivated, we're not going to do the things, okay? So there are tons of other emotions that are available to you. And let me back up for just a second because this is actually part of how I coach my clients. I coach my clients on something called the think-feel-act cycle. And what the think-feel-act cycle is, in a nutshell, is everything we do is caught, we do or don't do because of how we feel or how we think we're going to feel when we do the thing, okay? Mm. All of our feelings, all of our emotions, and 
Yes, men, you have emotions as well. Okay. Emotions are not just a girly thing. Um, oh, no, I, talk about that. I talk about it on the show quite often about it. Like good. more often than not, we're actually, we're actually, I, I, I can just like sometimes it's delayed, but it's like, you know, women are able to kind of like have their emotions come out like in a, in a relatively regular cycle. And we'll be the ones that like go and shoot up a, something like, just like, cause that's, that's all emotion. But we just, we just weren't dealing with it. So we weren't dealing with it in a healthy way. And we don't, we're not able to process it correctly. So, but that, that doesn't mean those things didn't exist. It just means we know how, need how to know how to show it better. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Okay. So all of our emotions are caused by our thoughts that we have about the thing. So let me lay this out. So when we start the diet, um, the thought about the diet is that this diet is going to be amazing. This diet is going to make me feel good. This diet is going to be the answer to all of my problems. And when we think those thoughts, we feel motivated. When we feel motivated, we do the things that the diet tells us to do. We go exercise, we eat the vegetables, we do all of that stuff. And when we do all of those things, our actions actually recreate our results. So our result is that I do start to feel better and I do start to lose weight and I feel stronger. But one day we're going to get on the scale and the scale isn't going to validate what we think our efforts were. So instead of losing three pounds, like we think we should, the scale is going to say you lost one pound. Meanwhile, we've lost the idea that one pound is still progress, right? Yeah. But our brain says that's not good enough. And this is hard. And I don't want to do this because it's hard and it's not working fast enough. Of course, our brain says it's not working, but what it really means is it's not working fast enough. And when we have those thoughts, we no longer feel motivated. In fact, we feel unmotivated. We feel discouraged. We feel frustrated. We feel all of this negative emotion. And when we feel that, of course, we don't want to eat vegetables and go for a run. Instead, we want to sit on the couch and eat Cheetos and watch reruns of, I don't know, net um like cheers or something like that and when we do that then our result is is that we don't get the result it, the the program stops working so that's kind of it in a nutshell and um i can't remember why i brought this up but um you asked what can we do to keep going and so i think first of all setting the expectation for yourself of I'm not always going to feel motivated. Sometimes it's actually going to be really hard and that's okay. I can do hard things. And what are other emotions that you can feel that will still produce the result? Determination, commitment. Like even though those aren't necessarily positive emotion, they are still emotion that's going to allow you to get the job done. And so the other piece of advice that I have is if you ever find yourself in a plateau or even, you know, outside of a plateau that you've gained weight, maybe what I want you to do preemptively is decide that I'm going to give this program a chance for six months or I'm sorry, six weeks, mm -hmm. four weeks, however long it is. I don't care but you cannot make any decisions on the spot. You cannot decide. It's an agreement that you have to have with yourself. You have to decide that on the spot, if I look at the scale and it doesn't reward me, then I still have to follow the program for another two weeks, four weeks, whatever, and then see if it's just a random day or if it really isn't working for me anymore. And then I can, with rational thought, decide what I want to do next. Because any person who's been successful in weight loss has not started with one plan and followed it all the way to the end. Every person, I mean, I did so many different things. And so, and I'm still doing different things. What I eat today is largely different than what I ate two years ago. 
And so, and how I exercise as well. And so we're always adapting, we're always pivoting. And so what I want to suggest is that when you're following this plan and the plan isn't working for you anymore, figure out what parts of the plan are working for you and what aren't. And then how do you pivot and adjust so that you can keep going? Because what we all want to be successful in the end. And here's another thing. And that is that anyone who has done any sort of project, weight loss, started a business, started a podcast, has had fails. We've all failed. Now, we think that failure is a moral failing, right? We think that everyone's looking at us, they're pointing their fingers at us. But the way that, how do I say this? The way that we become successful is how, what we make that failure mean. When we decide that the failure is a learning opportunity, then we can keep going. And we don't have to see that as being something about us. And okay, so here's a dating reference. And I don't know if you've, you've probably heard this before and you've probably even talked about it on your show before, but I heard this really great story about these uh, four friends, four guys, and they kept getting rejected by girls in bars. And so they made a pact that whoever could get the most rejections first would like, I don't know, win or something. So they all went out and set out to get like 20 rejections at a bar. And they did this every night. And what they found was that they got so much better at talking to women. And so it's kind of the same thing. Like when you have so many failures, then what happens is you don't make it mean anything about you because you're going to get successes in there too. And so the same thing applies to, you know, weight loss. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've I've definitely talked about the whole idea of running into failure versus backing away from it because there's such a fear-based thing versus if you make it your goal to like, okay, the goal is actually now to fail. So the success is in failing, but it's almost like a, a Jedi mind trick whereby in doing that, you suddenly care so much less and you're so much more indifferent that you get the results that you want. So, yeah. um, and even with like, even with weight loss too, it's like, I know with me, like when I was trying, when I was losing weight, I knew there'd be days where like, I would, I would lose like three pounds and then the next day I'd be back up two pounds and I'd just be like, well, that's just part of the process. But the, the end goal is over there. So this is bound to happen. I had a cinnamon roll yesterday, so that's, it's going to creep up on me, but it doesn't mean that tomorrow I can't work it off. It is what it is. And I was able to get to where I needed to be. So, but it's also true with women. When I was in college, uh, I remember I was very green dating. I hadn't had much experience. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to start asking out like some female friends of mine. I'm going to ask out like 10 girls and hopefully one of them will say yes. And the first three women I asked out all said yes. And I was like, what? (laughs) (laughs) You mean I just had to try? (laughs) Like, that's it? Like, and then I found out years later that unbeknownst to me in college, a lot of women had crushes on me and I just was too in my head about it to recognize that was going on. But the point is like, you got to put that, that energy in that, in that effort, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I did want to briefly touch on, uh, in terms of uh, having weight issues, how does that affect how you show up in a relationship in terms of whether how you feel about yourself or how you interact with your partner? Like, did you find there was any correlation with at the time, how you felt and then how you were showing up? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, but again, I think that that also, like if I was in a larger body today, I think that I would have way different thoughts than I did back then. Um, The truth of the matter is, is that there are men that like women who are larger and there are women who like larger men. Um, And, you know, I think that that was something that was a huge thing for me is I felt larger and, you know, going back to socialization of how we're socialized, I felt strange going out with someone who, a man who was smaller than me. I felt like as a woman, I should be the smaller petite person. Yeah. Okay. Um, Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. 
Oh no, no, because that's I mean that's definitely how we're social. How that's what we're made to believe. And it's I've, I've, as of late, I've had this this idea that like really only like ten to fifteen percent of the population on, on both on both men and women's sides are like the ones that are highlighted. So like, oh, like for guys that's, you know, we hear, oh, women want guy that's really fit and over six feet tall, makes a lot of money. But that, but I, in my personal dating journey, most women that I've dated have made more money than me and it hasn't been an issue for them. So it's like, well, we just highlighting these 10 to 15% of people and then making the rest of the population believe this is what it actually is. And when that's not really the case. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I know, but also, I also know with that said, I know it with, uh, at the time that I was at my 192 pounds or whatever, that in terms of how I felt about myself, like I, I, I've always had a generally good self-esteem about myself, but I definitely felt like crankier, moodier. Uh, I was easily bothered. Uh, my heart started feeling like it was pressuring itself to try to pump a little bit more. And so I know at that time, like if I was in a relationship, I don't know how it would have come across, but I imagine that I, I could have been a guy that was like, you know, easily tired or cranky and making the other person feel like what's going on with this person. Yeah. Well, and I think to uh, piggyback on that, like, I think that, for example, if my husband, then boyfriend, like brushed his hand across my belly, if that's something that's sensitive to me, or, you know, my derriere, derriere, but I don't know what you call it. Um, (laughs) You know, if that was sensitive to me, and I, you know, flinched or reacted to it, um, he might think that it was something that he did, but really that's all about me and how I feel in my body. So I think that that's also really important to highlight that when, you know, when we're dating, we, we look at what other, the other person does and we think it means something about us mm-hmm. and really it's all about them. So it's like a projection almost like. Yeah. Any kind of like anything that like you would say like oh well you must feel this way about me because I'm big and blah 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 it's like really that's the, their the own person's like inner mind that already has that agenda so they're going to push that out from somebody else and say it's also the thing that they're thinking as well yeah absolutely one hundred percent yeah and so like for example if one of the folks on this podcast if they were to you know touch their girlfriend in a way that she doesn't necessarily want to be touched or I don't want to say want to be touched but you know is sensitive in that area of her body and she flinches, they're going to think it's me when really it's that she's got some hang up on her body potentially. Hmm. It's interesting. I I found with, well, at least I'll say for myself, like even because women tend to be, I found very, um, if they really love their partner, they're very accepting of however they are, but that doesn't take away from, how we feel about ourselves. And so if I ever heard a comment like, oh, I still like you even being bigger, this is that, like, it's almost like you feel like it's a lie. Like that can't be a thing. But that goes back to what is what is my self-esteem about the situation? How am I thinking about it? And if, I may, if I'm hearing a different narrative, am I trying to push that to the side to be able to continue my narrative of what I have in my head about my size, my weight? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some practical steps first steps that men can take towards losing weight so that they're able to show up in their life with positive outcomes? Like what kind of habits should they be establishing just to kind of start them on the right track? Yeah. So I actually have um, a a guide. It's called the eight basic habits that healthy people do. I love it. It's the foundation of all of my work with my clients. And I'll tell you the eight basic habits right now. Um, But I love the idea of what I call displacement. And so when I work with my clients, that's the founding principle. And what I mean by that is we start doing things, we add stuff to your diet, we add stuff to your day so as to crowd out the stuff that we don't want to be doing. Because everyone on this podcast, you all know what you're supposed to be doing. You know that you're supposed to be drinking water. You know that you're supposed to be eating vegetables, eating protein, moving daily. These are the eight basic habits, by the way. Um, Moving daily, uh, getting enough sleep, managing your stress, uh, eating just enough, not too much, and then limiting your treats. Okay. So those are your, your eight basic habits and we all know what we're supposed to be doing. The question is, why don't we do them? And that's where we get into the, the coaching. So sometimes it's just setting yourself up for success. 
So going to the grocery store, buying fresh vegetables, or if you're never home, buy frozen vegetables. Frozen vegetables are often just as healthy as fresh. Um, And so that you have them. Make it easy on yourself. The other idea that I really love is what I call reducing friction. And here's what that means. So doing a little bit of planning and preparation so that you choose the easier, well, we always choose the easier path, okay? There's something, okay, so there's, I want to introduce another framework, which is called the um, motivational triad. And the motivational triad says that We always um, seek pleasure, avoid pain, and do it as efficiently as possible, okay? And so when we're always question, so when we set a goal to like go out for a run or eat vegetables or whatever it is that is on our plan, we're always confounded because we're like, why didn't I follow the plan, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe because you didn't make the plan easy enough. And so what I mean by that is when we set ourselves up for success, what that might look like is doing a little bit of planning and preparation so that when you come home from work, eating what you planned is actually easier and faster and more economical than going out to the grocery store or going out to the restaurant and getting your stuff, okay? And so really trying to figure out how do I take care of my future self? How do I take care of the person that I'm going to be this week and set myself up for success so that I can be successful and really have my own back? Nice. Okay. Uh, I do have one final question. This is probably an interesting one, but um, so there are over men, overweight men that either are in a relationship or are dating somebody and they may have a person they're dating that actually wants to help them on their journey. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, it can be a hard thing balancing out between like, because sometimes people are very sensitive. So it's like, say your significant other wants to be helpful, but she doesn't know how much to help or when to say certain things or, you know, how she can help in a way that's going to be beneficial without making you feel insulted. So how can men bring their partner into their weight loss journey? And also how can it be less sensitive about some of the help they may be wanting to help with? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, Let me think about that. Okay. So I want to start improving my health and I want support. I want support from my partner or my partner is offering me support. Uh, Sometimes it's both. Sometimes it's, um, I want the help. And other times it's like, hey, the other person's saying, hey, you said you want to achieve this weight loss goal. That's great. As a supportive person, especially because women are very supportive. I want to support you on this. How can I support? And I know sometimes there's a there's a hard thing of like, well, they don't want to cross a line or say like, hey, you know, put that chocolate down. Now the guy's feeling all bad and insulted. But it's like, but you asked to do that. So like, how does that how does one manage that? If they can't at all, I don't know. (laughs) Okay, so I I think I I have the question now, which is really funny because I'm a health coach. I'm a life coach and a weight loss coach, and I have a husband, and he will occasionally go on these little kicks where he wants to start exercising more or he wants to start eating better, and then I see him with the Cheetos or the, the chips, and I have learned to stay out of it. Quite honestly, I have learned to stay out of it because I'm not his mother. He gets to make his own choices and his own decisions. So I don't say anything. Okay. So if you see your partner eating something that she or he should not be eating, do not say anything. It is their choice. That being said, if you want to support this person, then I think that don't like rope them into going to a restaurant that they might not be able to find stuff at. Right. Um, d- ask. So, is this okay oh, that we have this for dinner? Are am I? Oh, sorry. So this is. You- 
Well, that that makes sense for the person that's that's volunteered to help. I'm saying yeah. that's the guy that is actually asking for the help or wanting the help and support. Yeah. Like, okay. how do you how do you manage it to where you don't get frustrated by that person? Because there's gonna be times where it's like they'll say, "Hey, babe, should you be eating that?" And then you're the guy's response is to be like, "Well, you know, what are you trying to say?" Or just, but they're the ones that ask. So, like, how do you how do you manage that? Yeah, that's actually a really good question because I think that when we tell people, and this goes back to money, also. I shouldn't say go back to money because we haven't talked about money, but it okay. does relate to money that we think that when we're on a budget, whether it's a calorie budget or a money budget, that we can't spend any money until we've saved enough money or we can't um, eat cheat foods until we've lost all of the weight, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that there's, well, especially for men, because men tend to be bigger. And so therefore you have a larger calorie budget. And why that's important is like, I heard that Shaq eats pizza every single day. He He owns a franchise. So yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think he eats like two pieces. And so that's like just a fraction. It would be like a bite of mine. But um, so what I, going back to the restrict binge regret cycle, one of the eight basic habits is limit treats. That doesn't mean eliminate treats. And so what I mean by that is you can have treats every single day. And so when, and I think that what this does is it also invites a better relationship with food because we have been taught diet mentality that you need to restrict all of your foods. And when you restrict, then when you get to your goal, then you can start eating pasta again. Then you can start eating pizza again. Then you can start drinking alcohol, eating chocolate, whatever it is. But up until then, you need to be really strict with your food. And I think that it creates a better relationship with food. And it also allows us to maintain the weight better when we can learn how to manage being in a world where there is tasty food and there is good food around us all the time. You mentioned Valentine's Day and the holidays. We cannot be in a restrictive cycle for the rest of our lives or until we get to our goal weight because when we do that, we kind of explode and we don't know how to manage being around tasty foods. And so I think that it's really important that on the path to success, that you're bringing in other things. Now, that being said, um, you know, understanding, not getting your uh, feelings hurt because your partner is trying to support you. And so if you've asked your partner to, to be a support, and first of all, I think that it's really important for you to call out what type of support you're looking for. Are you looking for them to not bring ice cream or cookies into the house so that you maintain a a clean environment? Or tell them, I want you to tell me when I'm overeating or when I'm eating things that I shouldn't be. Or I don't want you to tell me that. Okay. So I think that that's fair to say to your partner, Hey, I don't, I don't need the food police, you know, breathing down my neck. Um, and so those are some of the things that I would probably recommend. Yeah. Okay. That sounds great. Uh, so for men who want to work with you, where can they find out more about your services? Yeah. Well, so you can go to elizabethsherman.com slash habits and get that eight basic habits that healthy people do guide and checklist. That's actually a really good resource. Um, but you can also go to elizabethsherman.com, um, find me there as well as I'm on Instagram at esherman68 or on Facebook at Total Health by Eliz. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Elizabeth, for stopping by and giving us uh, the ins and outs about weight loss journey and how we can uh, better attack that on our own lives. Hopefully this helped you guys out. And if you want to hear more of these shows, you can uh, go to youtube.com slash Harry Wilmington, as well as uh, Apple, Spotify, Google. We're on all the podcast channels and stuff like that. Uh, Support the show by going to subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can also go to my website, introvertdatingsuccess.com. Click on the tip jar tab and send any kind of monetary thank you that you'd like to. Uh, That's all we got for today, guys. I'm Harry Wilmington. 
Uh, I will catch you guys on the next show. Thanks for watching, Thanks. and I'll check you next time. Peace.